Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, recently the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, well, we all know that as the FDA, they approved a test called 23andMe. It's a personal genetic test for some diseases that can be done in the comfort of your own home. Now, the FDA did caution consumers that these types of tests, they can tell you what your risk is for certain diseases Mm -hmm. based on your genes, but it won't give you a diagnosis. It won't tell you, for example, if you've got something like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. So is this the future of genetics, and how good is this new test? Here to discuss direct-to-consumer genetic testing is Dr. Matthew Ferber. Dr. Ferber is a clinical molecular geneticist and director of Mayo's Clinical Genome Sequence Sequencing Laboratory. Welcome to the program, Dr. Ferber. It's nice to meet you. Happy to be here. Whew, you got a long title. <laughs> hey, you know what? You you work in a really exciting field, don't you? I, I really feel lucky to be there, yes. And so tell us about this new test, 23andMe, because we're seeing it everywhere. Yeah, so I think the really compelling uh, descriptor of this test is that you can do it at home. Most genetic tests up to this date have really depended upon taking a blood sample or maybe uh, a piece of your skin in order to gather the DNA required to do the testing. This type of test can be done with just a simple, uh, a simple swab of the cheek or a spit tube. And matter of fact, for the 23andMe test, that's exactly what they do is they just collect a little bit of saliva within a tube and off to the laboratory it goes. How reliable is something that is just that simple? Yeah, the analytical performance of the test is just as high as any clinical laboratory testing facility. So the accuracy has been fully documented. And what does it tell you? The types of things that the test can tell you are broken down into a wide range of what I like to call infotainment on one side. You perhaps have heard things like, uh, how related are you to Neanderthal? Hey, I'm Scottish. Yeah, there you go. It's about the same thing, right? Okay. Uh, all the way up to whether or not you are a carrier for an autosomal recessive condition. And this might be important to you if you're planning a, a family in the, in the near future. And then just recently with the new FDA approval, it can tell you information about whether or not you're at risk for very specific, albeit limited, but specific health conditions. Like? Uh, Like cardiovascular disease, uh, your risk for having uh, venous thromboembolism, uh, things of that nature. Blood clot, exactly. Uh, It's not going to tell you uh, some of the the more uh, critical conditions like your risk for developing a hereditary cancer syndrome or something like that. That type of testing is still most appropriately handled in the more routine clinical diagnostic laboratory. In a really short amount of time, we have gone from here's what's going to be possible to, hey, you've got this possibility of this disease, you who just sent us some saliva. Um, is there any, I don't know, is there any sort of counseling that goes with this? I mean, this could be, this could really rock somebody's world. It really could. And I think that's where the FDA has done a really nice job in demanding that these types of consumer products have the appropriate back end, as we like to call it, associated with them as well. And that means if you were to get a potentially alarming result, you're not left out on an island. You actually have a mechanism to interact with the company and then ultimately get referred to genetic counseling services. But what if a person finds that out and doesn't follow through with that? I mean, that that, that news could very much change the direction of their life. Oh, absolutely. And it's hard to, it's hard to, really address all potential scenarios, but the, the, the help, the availability of help has to be made very clear to the individual. They would have to intentionally not want to pursue help if, you know, in order to not get the help that they needed. Well, people come at this with so many different angles, I'm sure. I mean, there's all the way from the concern like that to a curiosity, you know, what's my background? You know, I, um, we were speaking with a woman whose daughter is adopted And she wants to know more about her health situation. And and at this point, anyone who's adopted, when they go in, they just can take a pass on all that paperwork because it doesn't mean anything to them. That's right. Yeah. Does this kind of, does this help people like that, that don't know anything about their genetic history? It really can. It really can. So uh, there's a couple of things that will help. Number one is really just getting your arms around your ethnicity. There are, spe- there are specific ethnicities that are at different risk levels, base lit- risk levels for certain health conditions. 
One that pops to mind immediately is the Ashkenazi Jewish population. They have a very high incidence of many autosomal recessive conditions and autosomal dominant conditions, breast cancer being one of them. The hereditary form of breast cancer associated with BRCA1 and 2 mutations, they have two what are known as founder mutations. And so if an individual were adopted and they didn't have this family history information, just getting that ethnicity information in their hands can be extremely empowering. Now, that doesn't happen in every case, but you don't know going into the scenario what your ethnicity is going to be if you were adopted. So you, you told us that this test um, uh, would tell you what your risk of heart disease was or what your risk of having a blood clot was. But give us another example of something that the test, some test result that the patient could or should act on. I think that those are the, the right examples. Uh, if we could pull up a menu of the test, we could go through point by point. Um, I don't have the notes in front of me right now in order to do that. But those are the types of results that I think one could and should expect. And if you have questions about that result, two things could happen. You can access the 23andMe helpline, or you can take that report into your general physician and say, hey doc, I have this profile, I had this profile done, I see that I'm at an elevated risk for a heart condition. Okay. What can I do to lower that risk? Got and it. you, of course, I'm sure can name two to three things right off the top of your head that we should all be doing to manage our risks more appropriately. So what's the cost of, test, of the test and who ought to have it done? The test, I think, is around $199. Uh, their original test was around $99, and that was just for a lot of what I consider to be the infotainment components. And you start to add in the health risks, uh, the, the price does go up. You're getting deeper information. And quite honestly, it's more complicated information to, to, to build the test and build the appropriate interpretations and support staff. So it's about $199. Now, who should get it? Right. This is a really good question. Who should get it? If you think you have a medical condition, this is not the test to mm -hmm. rule that out. Mm -hmm. You should go and see your physician and talk to that physician about a medical genetics referral. This is really for the self-explorer, somebody who's really interested in genetics and genomics. They've seen it in the news. They think it's engaging. I'm going to try that just so I can kind of educate myself a little bit, raise my genomics literacy, if you will. That's the type of person that I would recommend having a test like 23andMe. Is it okay to ask him about, um, about Mayo genetic yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. what I was going to ask. I'll, I'll talk yeah, about sure, it in very vague ways. <laughs> okay. So 23andMe is a product that people can find out in the marketplace. But how is Mayo Clinic involved in this? What's happening at the Clinical Genome Sequencing Laboratory? Oh, very good. Uh, I've been waiting <laughs> for this question. So uh, part of the Center for Individualized Medicine here at the Mayo Clinic is to bring new technologies to the bedside. An intriguing component to the quote-unquote bedside was to reach beyond patients and individuals who are currently sick. So Mayo Clinic began looking at ways we could access the direct-to-consumer market as many as five years ago. At that time, I don't think the, the regulatory landscape or the, 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 the external uh, community was ready for a Mayo Clinic branded and type direct-to-consumer product. But over, over the years, we really have become more interested and more engaged. And we're currently working uh, in collaboration with a startup company called Helix uh, to develop Mayo's own version of a direct-to-consumer genomic product. Well, I'm going to wait for that one. Well, and that means you get to come <laughs> back and see us again. Yeah, uh, I would love to. I would love to be able to tell you much more about that product. Very good. All right, everything you wanted to know about genetic testing for the consumer from clinical molecular geneticist Dr. Matthew Ferber. Great to have you on the program. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.